Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Experts. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Barry Borlaug, who is professor of medicine and chair of research for circulatory failure and an invasive and heart failure cardiologist here at Mayo in Rochester. Today, our topic is assessing heart failure with preserved injection fraction. So we now know that probably over half of people with heart failure and disproportionately women have preserved ejection fraction, but the diagnosis is challenging. So welcome, Barry, to help us sort through this. Thank you, Sharon. It's uh, great to be here. So we know, and you've taught me a lot about how we continue to either miss or underdiagnose this condition. So how can we improve upon the diagnosis to enhance detection in these patients now that we have treatments, which we'll talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the key point. You know, um, it wasn't until the 90s when we really started to recognize that, you know, there are all these people with heart failure, that the normal ejection fraction, that that was possible. And there was sort of a backlash after that. Some people were saying like, well, if you look carefully, there's something else that could be causing their symptoms. A little bit of obesity, maybe some some low-grade lung disease, maybe some coronary disease. So people, there was this movement against that. But We've really started to recognize more that, you know, obesity along with hypertension and female sex are really key pathophysiologic drivers of heart failure. And um, obesity, as you know, is a epidemic in worldwide, but particularly in the United States. Um, so these people that are coming in who are uh, overweight or obese and short of breath um, too often are getting neglected or um, falsely reassured that you're just too heavy. Or people that are getting older, we know that HFPEF is, you know, in large part disease, a disease of aging, um, are are told that you're just getting older. That's the reason for your shortness of breath. When in fact they have HFPEF. So that's the big problem: is the marked under detection of this. And for years we've suspected this, but now there's some new data that really helps us to see that maybe as much as a third of patients with HFPEF out there in the community have no diagnosis. Uh, so we've, this has been a big emphasis now, as you say, with speci with specific treatments um, to enhance detection, clinical detection of people with HFPEF. So, uh, you know, we do have somebody who comes in and they are overweight, say it's an overweight 55 year old woman. And uh, and so aside from, yes, maybe deconditioning and being part of this are there other things that aren't HFPEF that we should be looking for so we can specifically treat them and then kind of circle back to who are the ones we really want to see you or see a cardiologist? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think it, it's important to step back, I think, and think about what heart failure is and how we sort of gold standard universal definition, which there is now. And, you know, it's signs and symptoms, breathlessness, fatigue, um, some edema that's related to a cardiac abnormality that's associated with congestion. Congestion is very important. And you can assess congestion by physical exam. And when it's really obvious, you see jugular distension and gallop sounds and things like that. Um, you can look at it by echo. You can look at it by blood work with natric peptide testing. But a lot of times these are all pretty normal. And the gold standard to do that is with invasive assessment in the cardiac cath lab. And um, about two thirds of people with HFPEF have high cardiac filling pressures or hemodynamic congestion at rest, but about a third, it's only abnormal during exercise. So um, we've begun to use invasive exercise testing as the gold standard. It really has become the gold standard to make the diagnosis. We used that data to derive a score that you could use in the clinics um, when you're seeing patients to estimate the probability that they might have HFPEF. So what we did is we looked at a very large series of patients who had undergone invasive exercise testing, gold standard, to determine who does and who definitely does not have HFPEF. And then we, um, in, we derived the variables in this score that were significant predictors of having HFPEF or not having HFPEF. And we came up with what's called this H2 HFPEF score. Um, and if the score is high, it ranges from zero to nine. It's based on six variables, four clinical variables and two echo variables. And if the score is six, seven, eight, nine, you can basically take it to the bank that they have half path. 
If the score is zero, it's very, very unlikely. If it's one, it's pretty unlikely. If it's two to five, you need some further workup. Um, so this is just a way that everybody can use in general cardiology clinic and primary care clinic to estimate if somebody's coming in with breathlessness, what's the po- what's the probability? It's a very Bayesian approach. And if it's in that intermediate range, you need to refer on for additional testing to make a workup. Yeah. So they need an echo and a clinical evaluation. And then we can use this score to kind of decide next steps. Right. Um, so obviously cardiologists, we, there's not enough car- cardiologists in the U.S. for everyone to see every breathless patient. So I think just having this score could really help. But but score or not, when should these folks see a cardiologist? And then when do they need to see somebody like you who's really an expert in this? So the score is um, for clinical variables. So the presence of obesity is worth two points. Any history of atrial fibrillation, which is very common in HEFPEF, is worth three points. So any history um, being age 60 or greater is worth a point. And hypertension requiring two drugs or more is one point. And then there are two things from echocardiography, um, estimated right ventricular systolic pressure of 35 or greater, and then an EE prime ratio of 10 or greater. Um, So the highest score possible is nine. As I said before, six is very, very likely. If you've got somebody who has got one of those intermediate scores, a score of three, a score of four, um, a score of five, that's somebody you'd want to refer on. to, to make to ensure the diagnosis. A score of five is associated with a 75% probability that they have, 75 to 80% probability. So in some ways you could say you probably have HEFPATH, um, but if you want you know, that certainty, you can refer on for additional testing. That could be uh, the gold standard, as I mentioned, would be referring to the cath lab for invasive exercise testing. And that's frequently what we do here at Mayo. Um, those patients with intermediate pretest probability to get the the definitive diagnosis with invasive testing. Other groups have used exercise echocardiography, um, which has some value but can have some equivocal results too. So there's some disagreement in the literature there, but that's another possibility or sort of a tiered approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, it's based on those patients that have sort of intermediate. So maybe they. They're a little bit older and, you know, they're obese, um, but other findings are not quite clear. That would be somebody with a score of three, for example, and they would they would merit further evaluation. Um, so I think a lot of it depends on what's available locally. Um, not all centers uh, have the capability to perform invasive hemodynamic exercise testing. So exercise echo could be done um, in that setting with referral on to another center if if necessary, for example. Can you, for, for those of us who don't accompany you into the cath lab, can you share a little bit about the actual kind of just a, a thumbnail of the study that you do on these suspected intermediate, say intermediate patients? What, what are you looking for and what do you have the patient do? Yeah, that's a great point. Great question. Um, so you know, again, the gold standard is an elevation in left atrial pressure or LVN diastolic pressure, which we measure in the cath lab as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So uh, we gain access to the right heart, usually through the jugular vein, uh, balloon tip catheter, measure the pressure in the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and then in the wedged position, which is our surrogate for left atrial pressure. And uh, we do that at rest, and then we do it during exercise. Um, in our laboratory, we also uh, perform metabolic measurements of oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. So uh, it's like a CPET essentially in the cath lab. Uh, sometimes we also bring echo in. But what we're looking for is an elevation in that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. If it's 15 millimeters of mercury or greater at rest, that makes the diagnosis. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, about a third of patients with HEFPEF it'll be normal at rest, but it only becomes abnormal during the stress of exercise. So they're they're sort of euvolemic. They're not like volume overloaded, but they can't engage in physical activity without the cost of high filling pressures. So then if we're looking for a wedge pressure of 25 or greater during exercise, that then also satisfies the diagnosis. If they don't meet either of those thresholds, then we've excluded HEFPEF. Um, and then we should be looking down other avenues deconditioning or, you know, other rare causes, lung disease, et cetera. We clearly need to, now that we have tools and we'll talk about 
in detail about some of the new treatments in a future podcast with you, but maybe just mention wh- why, you know, give a little background on why we're we're doing this and kind of what's next. Um, there aren't enough of people like you, Dr. Borlaugs, who are doing these exercise tests. I mean, you intimated it, but I, I suspect that access to anything beyond exercise echo um, is probably limited to a lot of the people who are watching this podcast. So um, I, I think perhaps what's your pitch for why they should continue to try to make this diagnosis? Yeah, well, let me, I mean, so for years we did this. Uh, when we started doing this testing, uh, I'd get that question from the od- somebody in the audience, like, well, there's no proven effective treatment for HFPEP, so why are we doing this? Right. And the answer at that point was because people want to know what's wrong with them. And that has great value. And I can't tell you how many people, especially women in their you know 50s or 60s, and it's like their fourth opinion, and they just consistently are told that you know, like the things I said earlier, they're too heavy, they're getting too old, that you know, it's in your head, psychological, and um, just in tears when they find out because they're the value of knowing uh, the validation of having a real organic cause. For symptoms that in, in itself can be very therapeutic. So for, for years, that's all we had. And that still is very valuable. Yes. But beyond that, now we have proven treatments and that clearly reduce the risk of heart failure, hospitalization, or cardiovascular death, and that clearly improve health status, reduce symptom severity, improve exercise function. So these are all the things that we want to do. So it's, you know, we can no longer um, lean on that crutch, <laughs> like, well, there's nothing you can you can do about it anyway, because now we can do things about it. So we owe it to our patients to know what, you know, what's causing it. Is it heart failure? And really, the onus is on us to make the diagnosis so we can treat them correctly, which, as you say, we'll talk about in a different podcast. Um, you know, doing these invasive studies, um, it used to be very much a niche thing, um, but the number of laboratories that have this capability is really increasing. It's being perceived as more of a an indicator of a really strong lab that that can do this. Um, so I would say a lot of tertiary medical centers around the country now have this available. Um, you know, this was how it was with the start of PCI too. You know, it was uh, <laughs> very rare that people could do you know angioplasty for coronary artery disease. So it's you know once we see that the value the the availability will continue to increase. So I don't think we can use that as an excuse anymore. Yeah, and I agree with you, Barry, that the the value of validating symptoms um, and t- telling somebody that they what they have and that their experience is real is is worth it, right? Even if you don't have a specific treatment, because I would say the same thing with microvascular dysfunction um, yes. and a few other relatively understudied. Um, conditions because they occurred predominantly in women and we we weren't digging in for that. So, you know, now we have twice as much, but I, I agree with you, even before we had treatments, it was worth it, um, yes. uh, in my opinion. Um, so exciting stuff. And thanks for making the case for why we should care and why we should push to get a proper diagnosis for these individuals that we all see. And if we reflect on our practices, um, have been seeing for a long time and probably were missing. So thank you very much, Barry, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This wraps up this week's episodes of Interviews with the Experts. I'd like to thank Dr. Borlaug for joining me today and discussing this really important topic. We look forward to you joining us again next week for another interview with the expert. Be well.